It is a pleasure to welcome you to the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is an pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. It is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. Today's lecture is on sensors and NDT techniques in geotechnical engineering, which will be delivered by Professor Kenichi Soga and Dr. Wayne Muller. Kenichi Soga is the Donald H. McLaughlin Chair and a Chancellor's Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He is also a faculty scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He obtained his Bachelor of Engineering and Master of Engineering from Kyoto University in Japan and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He was Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Cambridge before joining UC Berkeley in 2016. He has published more than 400 journal and conference papers and is the co-author of Fundamentals of Soil Behavior, third edition with Professor James K. Mitchell. His current research activities are infrastructure sensing, performance-based design and maintenance of underground structures, energy geotechnics, and geomechanics. He is a fellow of the UK Royal Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers. He is the recipient of several awards including George Stevenson Medal and Telford Gold Medal from the Institution of Civil Engineers and Walter L. Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize from the American Society of Civil Engineers. He is the chair of Technical Committee TC105 Getechnics from Micro to Macro of the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering and the chair of the Emerging Technologies Committee of ASCE Infrastructure Resilience Division. He is a backer fellow of UC Berkeley, promoting commercialization of smart infrastructure technologies. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me to give this particular presentation. It's really great to see uh, many people uh, wanted to uh, come to this lecture and uh, uh, listen to what I'm going to say. So uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm Kenichi Soga from uh, UC Berkeley. Um, today I would like to talk about a little bit about sensing and I call it smart geotechnical infrastructure, really trying to introduce some of the new te emerging technologies coming into uh, uh, geotechnical engineering in terms of sensing. Uh, just to give you my, our, the background of our research, we do a variety of things uh, in our group. Uh, of course, we're very much hard in terms of geomechanics. So we do a lot of geomechanical modeling that we see over here. And what I'm gonna focus today is more about infrastructure sensing and hopefully, hopefully it will uh, sort of uh, find something that it will interest you. And then we also do infrastructure modeling, really modeling the uh, infrastructure as a much larger scale. But today I'll focus on uh, this particular part, but if you want to know more about it, please go to this particular uh, website that gives you a little bit more information. So uh, uh, as uh, being introduced, I used to be at Cambridge University and I was there for 22 years before coming to uh, UC Berkeley in 2016. And one of the projects that I was involved when I was in the UK was this particular London Bridge Station upgrade where you can see a sort of a beautiful sculpture of a shard over here. And this particular station is called London Bridge Station. And it's one of the oldest station in London. And what they were trying to do is to, while trains are running, they start renovate this particular uh, station with a new roof, as you can see over here. But at the same time, you have a longer trains and more frequent service, more people to be used. And that was the idea of this particular one. It started in 2013 and it just finished recently. So uh, just to give a little bit of background, why I'm a little bit more philosophical to start with, that London Bridge Station was started in 1836 in this particular purple part. But as the demand increases, you can see that the footprint increases. But in 1970s, which is shown over here, they made a huge uh, renovation on that particular station. But then after 40 years, which is uh, 2012, they made another change. So you can see that the demand and the change comes every 40 years, which uh, is very interesting from our geotechnical and or civil engineering point of view. And one thing important thing to realize is sometimes we design our infrastructure to last for more than 100 years. But when you start to look at the demand change, so if you see big cities uh, in the world, they the demand changes every 40 years or it can be less. So the cycle of change is much faster than what we expect this uh, sort of infrastructure to last. 
meaning that even though you design this for 100 years, you may have to change it after 40 years. So, so the idea is that can you make your infrastructure more adaptive, like reuse of foundation or change in diameter tunnel, and that's something you want to do. So if you want to make a change, then you have to understand the real performance of your infrastructure. So, so, so um, maybe our 100 years design life concept may not be compatible with the actual demand in the future. But at the same time, if you start to think about, okay, I want to embed our sensors in our uh, infrastructure to look after for a long time, many of the sensors don't last very long. So the question is, uh, what kind of sensor which has a long-term durability or what kind of power supply, which technology is available so you can push it for long, lifelong monitoring? So, so as I said, making our infrastructure more adaptable is interesting, but of course we have natural hazards, so it has to be as resilient against sudden changes. But uh, for example, if we can embed our long lifelong sensing, we may be able to understand the real performance of our infrastructure, so the infrastructure itself can be more adaptable. So would it be nice to say that there be no more aging, aging infrastructure for future generations? Uh, so what is the role of geotechnical engineers to realize this? And one is really to say, let's try to monitor our infrastructure better so we can make changes if the demand changes. So, so that's led to our interest. So at that particular London Bridge Station, we did a lot of variety of things like fiber optics monitoring, which is the main feature of our talk today. But you see a lot of LiDAR monitoring nowadays. You can do social media tracking. Now you can do computer vision to create a sort of a virtual digital twin of our infrastructure. And at the same time, you can start to really see how the uh, infrastructure is used, like real time people monitoring by doing the head counts and then trying to simulate that. And then you, you do some real time movement. And then uh, this particular station, station was surrounded by hospitals, so you may want to do noise monitoring. So there are new technology trying to monitor lots of data coming out in wireless and send them wirelessly. So, so uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but what I want to do today is really to focus on fiber optics monitoring or some technology that we can use in geotechnical engineering. So, so in geotechnical engineering, one of the things that we do in terms of quality assurance and control is really about limit the movements. So there are examples of new generation distributed strain or displacement sensors coming. One is the focus of today is really what I call distributed fiber optic sensing. So, so you install your fiber optic sensor in your infrastructure and then you monitor. Now they can go down to a level of what we call one micro strain. So when I say my one micro strain resolution, um, in a sense that um, if you have a one meter gauge length times the strain, it's about one to 10 micro strain, a micron resolution. So you can start to see the movement for that particular accuracy. And I'll show you some example here. Computer vision is coming out very strongly nowadays. So if you fix a camera, you can really go down to 0.1 millimeter resolution. If you have some sort of a LIDAR system or sort of a other system, uh, you, you can scan and then you do the scanning again, but perhaps you have to move this device uh, in different locations. So if it's not fixed, you may be going to millimeter resolution. And then uh, you start to see this wireless sensor network uh, coming where you can continuously monitor at difficult to access sites. And, uh, these are the uh, sort of a devices now available in terms of measuring tilt, displacement. You can get the laser displacement or camera. So and these are the actually these are the companies that spin out from our research group trying to uh, commercialize and trying to sort of uh, deploy these in real environments. But today I would like to focus on this particular interesting technology because I really want to promote this technology uh, to you. But I'm trying not to trying to come here to sell the products. I'm not a, a sort of a person to sell the product, but I really want to show the confidence in delivery. How does it work? And then hopefully you find the value, not just looking at the product, but show, I want to show you the confidence in delivery. And uh, Dr. Keith Bowers from London Underground said, if innovations have more chance of adoption, if their benefits are mapped. So let's try to show what are the benefits we can get from these uh, technologies. 
So I'd like to show some of the cases like a pile load test, large diameter circular shaft, and retaining walls uh, with some numerical analysis that is related to our heart of geotechnical engineering. Just to give you the technology itself in a very briefly, it, what this particular technology does is that you use a standard optical fiber. It's a very standard that you use for telecommunication. So if you're sending a sort of a, a information, you digitally, this light will give you some uh, sort of information and transport to one location to the other. This particular technology is that if you shoot a light, every point along the fiber, there will be a backscatter light. That means that most of the light goes through the fiber, but there are always some light that comes back because the material is a little bit heterogeneous. So what happens is that if you strain somewhere or if you heat up somewhere, the molecular structure of this particular part changes. And what it does is that if you shoot a light, and then at this point, a backscatter light comes back. And if you look at the frequency content of that backscatter light, we can get what that strain is. And you can get a variety of fiber optics nowadays, and some of them are, you can see over here, is that very, very, they're very inexpensive, like this will probably cost about 20 cents per meter. Uh, some of these are a little bit more robust. You can see a fiber with a little bit more coating around. This will cost about $5 per meter. And then some of them are a little bit much more robust and maybe a little bit $10 or $20 per meter. But it's really a supply and demand at the moment is that, for example, we are the only few one that uses this. But if many people start to use it, of course, the, uh, demand, uh, the demand increases and therefore it becomes cheaper. And at the same time, uh, we want to measure temperature. So this one is that if you step on it, there's a direct strain transfer to the fiber. Whereas this one is actually the fiber is floating in the gel. So if you step on it, actually there's no strain transfer, but then there will be, uh, if the temperature changes, it will detect the temperature change. So, so we use different cables to measure strain or temperature. Uh, you can see that uh, typically fiber optics will have a core, which is where the light goes through. So this is the core, which you just show over here. And then it's surrounded by the cladding. The cladding is like to trying to shield the light not to go out. So this one is like a tunnel of light goes through. And then what happens is that as the light goes through, you get what we call backscatter light for every point along the fiber. And then you have a protective a sort of a material, which is a buffer or something more uh, robust. So the idea is that if you shoot a light, and then uh, every point you get the optical backscatter light, and you know actually where the backscatter light came back from if you do the timing. For example, if you shoot a light at t equals zero, and if you know your delta t when it came back, your light of speed times delta t will give you where it came back from. So if you shoot a light, the one that close to you will come back early and then you look at your frequency component. You shoot a light and then you, it will come back a little bit later and then you look at the frequency of that particular light. And you do that for entire length for about 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers. And that allows us to measure strain and temperature or vibration at every point along the fiber with just using a standard optical fiber. So, so there, uh, when you look at the light in terms of frequency component, there's different scattering one, but you don't have to know a little bit, this is a little bit more optics, but there's one particular scattering light that you can see a sh sort of a peak over here. And if this is called brilliant uh, sort of peak, and if the peak shifts, it reflects that this particular one has some strain or temperature change. This one is a Rayleigh one. If you see the amplitude change, it gives you the vibration characteristic of that particular point, for example. And the Ramon one is that if you look at that point, if this particular amplitude increases, that particular point is changing temperature. So by using all these techniques, you can start to get the temperature or strain or vibration at every point along the fiber. So, so having that in my mind, I can show you one example which is very worth familiar with. Let's say we put an optical fiber in a pile. So if you apply a pile and then what you do is apply a load. So here you see a load 
versus number of measurements. So you'll start to see load increasing with time, for example. And if you apply the load, what you're going to see is that you have a larger strain at the top and smaller strain at the bottom. And then the strain at the top will start to increase and so as the bottom over here. So what I'm going to show here is the distance of the pile, which is from the top to the bottom, and then the compression because you see more compression at the top. So now I'm increasing my load and then this is all the points. You can get every point, for example, every two centimeters and there are all lots of thousands of points that you can connect it. And as you increase the load, you can see increase in the compression over here and then decrease in strain because that's where you have your shaft friction. So for example, if you look at that particular point, you see this gradient. That gradient, the reason why your strain is decreasing is because you're gonna have a shaft friction. So the gradient is related to shaft friction at that particular point. Now you can start to see at point point, you start to see interesting localized strain over here. And the reason why this particular pile changes geometry at this particular location, and therefore you have some increasing in strain over here. So in other words, you can start to see some localized effect because you all have a continuous measurement. If you only have a point measurement, you may miss some of these. So as you can see now it's unloading. So your strain is recovering, but you see a residual strain. Now you're increasing again, and then you can see a continuous profile of strain, which allows us to get the shaft friction. So, so um, I'll give you more example of this. This is a particular site in London where we had a very long pile, which is embedded into the chalk. And then we did uh, pile loading with fiber optics embedded. And this is a very large diameter pile, 2.4 meters diameter. And then it goes down to 50, 60 meters deep. And uh, there are a variety of reasons why this was done, but I'll not, not go into much detail, but the point is that here we use what we call low test or old Osterbrook cell test. Rather than applying a load from the top that you see before, we apply a load in the middle or the, at the bottom. And by putting the fiber optics in here, when you increase your, your load over here, you have large strain at the bottom. And then because of the shaft friction, your strain will decrease and go down to zero. So, so what you do is that you install your optical fiber in the cage while it's being constructed. So, so the fiber optics goes down and goes up and then goes down again and goes up. And that is shown over here with one going down, two coming up, three down going down and four going up. And this is the sort of profile going up and down, which allow us to get a strain distribution at four different locations of the pile. And at the same time, we can add the temperature cable. So a temperature cable goes down and up, and you can also go like this. And actually the fiber optics are embedded into the piles at different location of the pile, but you splice it, you connect all these together into the analyzer. So when you apply your load, you shoot a light and you get the temperature profile and strain profile at once through using this particular technology. And this is the strain cable you use, and this is the uh, temperature cable we used. And you can see that the cable here, uh, the fiber optics are embedded in a gel, so you don't have a strain transfer. So, so in terms of installation, this is the sort of ball pile. So you put it, uh, you connect it at the bottom cage, and basically you have this drum of cables that goes along. When the cage goes down, it just goes down. And then you splice it, I mean, while you splice it, you clip your cable. So the uh, workers are here clipping the cable. And as it goes down, you clip, clip. And then you pretension a little bit to make sure that it's tight. And then what you do is that you pour your concrete to create your pile. So eventually you may have something like that with only four, some cables coming out. And you see one of the cable, which is a temperature cable, and one is a strain cable. And this is quite clean. And the point is that each, the fiber will give you thousands of strain data just from the cable. Whereas if you use a conventional strain gauge, you see that you have one strain gauge with one cable. So you have lots of cable coming out for conventional pile uh, sort of testing. So you can see the mess of the cables where this is very, very clean. Now, once you apply your load from over here, if you apply your load, of course, the strain will be the largest at where you apply your load. 
But then because of the shaft friction you have, you have a decrease in strain and that decrease in strain is related to shaft friction. So if your gradient is large, means that you have larger shaft friction. And obviously, as you increase the load, this triangle become larger, and therefore your gradient becomes larger, means that your shaft friction become larger as the displacement increases. And what you see over here is the actual data set. So the yellow is when you have a small load, and as you increase the load, it changes to blue to purple, and you can see a nice sort of a triangular shape which represents something like this. So you can see if you take the average, you can see that shaft friction is developing as the gradient increases. But you may also see, oh, this is quite wavy data compared to the one that I showed you earlier, which was much closer to very smooth line. And this puzzled us in a sense that why is the strain so variable? And you may argue that instrument is not good. But the point is that you having lots of data to create this waviness, meaning that it's not like data one over here and another data over here or data over here. There's a lot of data to create this particular shape. And the frequency is about three meters. So this puzzled us, but then actually I'll come back to this later on. Let's look at, we had a strain gauge at that part, Paul. So you may have a discrete gauge like that. If I plot our fiber optics data, you can see it has a fluctuation but it does follow the uh, strain gauge. And maybe if we have lots of strain gauges, it may have followed this particular line. Now let's go to this particular waviness. So I'm applying a load of 25 mega Newton at this particular point and it give you the largest strain at the bottom. And then it decreases because you have a shaft friction. That means that strain is decreasing. And this particular data set is from cable number one. And cable number two is totally independent data, but if I plot the uh, cable number two, it shows like this. And if I plot the cable number three, it's like this. And if I plot the cable number four, it's like this. And you may show that the waviness follows similar pattern within four independent cables, implying that all the cables, although they're very independent, they're showing similar waviness, implying that it may not be the instrumentation issue, it is the concrete heterogene heterogeneity of the concrete issue, perhaps. So that is quite interesting to uh, see. Now, what you can do with this strain data is that obviously if you integrate once, it gives you the displacement. So if I integrate strain, I get the displacement profile. And all you know is that if you have a lot of randomness, if you integrate, it becomes much smoother curve. So this is the displacement profile and I'm measuring the displacement at the top so I can integrate from the top. And then I know the strain so I can get the displacement profile all along the fiber. And this shows at different load how the displacement in the pile is changing. And then what, I, we, what we had in this pile is that we had extensometers actually measuring the displacement at different location of the pile. And this is shown level six, or level six is at the top and level five, level four. So if you look very carefully over here, the tip of the old cell and the extensometer is the one that where we had a gauge, a displacement gauge from the top to the bottom measuring the displacement over here. And that is shown in the solid line. And then when I can go to this curve and go to the top bottom of the cage, uh, uh, on top of the old cell, and file how my load as an increased displacement and changing. And if I plot that, I get this uh, orange and blue. And they match very nicely in the order of millimeters, 10 millimeters with a load increase. If I look at level three, for example, this particular point, I get the displacement at different load and plot the data, it comes over here and that's my blue uh, and orange. And if I look at the extensometer data, it matches nicely. So it means that the fiber is measuring the real displacement or measuring the real strain and gives you the good displacement. So that means that the fiber itself becomes extensometer. Once you have the displacement, actually here you know your displacement, how load is changing. So that gives you the displacement profile 
and then and then you can get for example for a given load maybe you can get for a given soil a shaft friction and that allows us to give what we call tz relationship or tz relationship where typically when we do a power analysis using one dimensional fe we do what how the relative motion of the soil to the pile will give you for a given shaft friction and that is called tz relationship and actually we can derive our guesstimate our tz relationship from this particular data set and that is shown over here this is a relative displacement of the thanate sand which is over here and then you see how the shaft friction is increasing as the relative displacement between the soil and the pile is increasing and that gives you the frictional characteristics and this is the input of the tz relationship and now you can see four different cables showing relatively good data sets. If you got this particular one, which is Lambeth Group, you see initially it has zero friction and it slips. And then after that, it starts to increase friction. And that's quite interesting to see that initially it's slipping, but then as it times, as the displacement increases, it engages with the soil and then start to develop a shaft friction and then linking to the peak. And then you start to see chalk that's a little bit more heterogeneous at the bottom. And then you see a variety of the, you see a lot of variation, but then eventually maybe coming up to develop this shaft friction. So you can start to get this sort of a TZ relationship or TZ relationship from these data sets. The other thing you can do is to measure temperature. So you can see, you can see a temperature rising during the curing of the concrete. So if you measure your concrete curing over here where the temperature is rising and what you see is that the pile at the bottom one side of the pile is heating more than the other side. And it's sort of the other way is the other way around at the higher location. The other interesting thing to look at is this particular waviness is similar to the frequency of the strain profile that you see. And what allows us this to do is to see whether the temp and we start to see this in pile integrity tests is that we want to measure the temperature of the pile during the concrete curing process to see whether there's some uh, defaults in our concrete pile for example so the point here is that once you know how the temperature at different location is changing you can get a temperature change with time at different level of your piles so in this case, I have uh, within one meter or so, I get about uh, sort of a 20 points. So I have thousands of points for one location of the cable to get a temperature change with time. So if I have this particular cable at four different location where I'm measuring the temperature at every depth for every say two centimeters for many, many depth and every point I have a temperature increase and decrease during the concrete process. And I can do a simple one dimensional heat transfer uh, modeling where the pile is generating heat during the curing process and dissipating heat into the soil. And the only thing we're doing trying to do is to find out by understanding, by, by varying the location of the pile and soil, meaning that the pile radius at the position, position that we're measuring, we can sort of a match our analysis to our temperature data to find out what is the pile diameter at that particular location. And I can do that for four different location within one cross section, but I have thousands of slices to do that. And by doing that, I can get the shape of the pile. And by doing that, you can start to see a larger pile diameter at Thanet sand area where you had a good shaft friction. And then here you have a smaller diameter or radius in your pile, which we saw that this particular one had a little bit of slip and then increasing uh, its shaft resistance during the loading stage. So you can start to see some relationship between pile shape and the performance of a pile during the loading. So the point here is that I put the fiber optics really to do some construction quality control 
but also when you look at real loading performance. And maybe in the future in California, we have earthquakes, so we're worried about power, maybe damage after the earthquake. If the fiber is embedded, you can come back and connect that fiber and see what kind of strain it is. And if it's broken, you must have a large strain and therefore you can do future proofing. Or in non-earthquake region, you may be nearby construction where you may be worried about your piles, where you can start to say, okay, if I have a tunnel nearby, how is my pile is performing? So it's really about future proofing. So there are a lot of application nowadays. We started about 15 years ago. You can see that the, the, this particular Northern Line Extension project where they, they did this thermal integrity test using fiber optics for 100 diaphragm wall panels and the piles and replacing methods such as sonic logging in this particular case. Here, uh, we sort of are putting fiber, uh, fiber optics in post graduate drilling shaft with uh, Caltrans in California, putting fibers and then grouting at the base to have a better base resistance, putting fibers in ground anchors to understand how the ground anchors are performing. We can put up around the piles to uh, pipes to, to look at when the fault is moving, uh, how the pipe is responding to the fault. We put fibers in this seepage cutoff walls in, uh, in uh, Sacramento with the US Army Corps of Engineers to understand the performance of the cutoff falls when the river levy uh, water level goes up and then this particular uh, levee start to deform. We can start to put some fibers on the ground to look at ground movements for landslides and et cetera. Uh, for tunneling, you can put fiber optics in your tunnel segments. And this is in the precast condition. You put the fiber optics in your concrete segments and then you erect your uh, segments to measure the strain developing while the soil load is coming. Or you can have this cable attached to the spray concrete condition. So you attach your cable and then you do the spray concreting. In this particular case, you excavate over here. So we wanted to know the strain developing when you excavate the cross passage and you get the strain profile around your cross passage area to understand the design has been done uh, uh, adequately. Uh, it's happening like in Singapore, uh, they start to embed the fiber in their new 51 kilometer deep uh, sewer tunnel, which they're going to put fiber optics. It will be 51 kilometers and you can see a lot of cable. So there'll be 200 kilometers worth of cable embedded in the, between the primary lining and then the second lining, which will be precast. So the fiber will attach over here, and then you put the, uh, the secondary lining and really to protect your sewer for the next 100 years or 40, 50 years while it's being used. Uh, there are other applications. For example, this will be sort of a pavement where we attach our cables in the pavement. And then you do that. We use this for really to guide the self-assisting, self-driving cars. So, so not just self-driving cars uses the car to navigate each other, but really using as a pavement as a sort of a sensing. So, so you embed your fibers and what you can start to do is that you can drive your truck. And as you drive your truck, you can start to see the truck start to move like this. And you can see your truck is moving as it goes along. And what I want you to look at is the level of strain over here is one micro strain. So we're looking at one micro strain, which is really, really small movements through this particular technology, which is called distributed acoustic sensing technology. You can also have uh, one of my students had a puppy. So it's so a dog running over here. And that's the dog running along that one. And you can see the trace of it. And this is what we see how the dog is running. And you can see the magnitude of strain is 0 0.02 micro strain. This is really, really small, like 20 nano strain. So that you can start to see the movement. And what we're trying to do is to use this for detecting people, pay, uh, the pedestrians using, so it can assess the self-driving cars. We make our analyzer. So this is something that we do. And, and, but what I want to do in the next uh, five, six, 10 minutes or so is to give a little bit more examples in terms of geotechnical engineering. So this is one of the uh, work that we did in terms of 
monitoring this circular shaft while it's being excavated. And it's called, it's uh, with the Thames Water, where this was the largest shaft that will be excavated, that's being excavated for sort of about 70 meters deep, and the diaphragm wall you see is 84 meters deep. And the thickness is 1.2 meter thick. So, so the uh, cross section shows over here, you have a long 1.2 meter di uh, thickness diaphragm wall circular shaft you see over here. And then uh, the excavation depth is 70 meters and you can see the stratigraphy at different uh, at depth level. And the point is that we had the fiber optics attached in this particular uh, wall. So, so our interest is really uh, understanding the performance of the wall during the excavation. And the reference designs show in Plaxis says that the dis vertical displacement over here will be about seven millimeters. And if you use more uh, reference design, it's about 13 millimeters. So, so we're talking about really small movements as we know that in nowadays our geotechnical engineers do. And there are a lot of uh, interest in terms of how do you a sort of a look at how do you design things in circular shafts. Now, it, it, what we wanted to do was to install the optical fibers and we wanted to know the bending of the wall. So in this particular case, you put the optical fiber at two sides of the wall. So if the ball wall bends by the earth pressure, that means that you have compression on this side and tension on this side, meaning that the difference in the strain will give you what we call bending strain. And that bending strain allows us to see what is the bending moment of this particular wall as the excavation is done. So, so this is where the cable is attached to this particular cage and there's one cable on one side and another cable going on the other side. And you can see the cage going down where the cable is attached around the cage what you see over here. And also we had a fiber that is measuring hoop strain as well. This one shows the data sets and the one we want to highlight first is the green and red. And this is what we call incremental bending moment. That means that when you excavate from here to here, if you make this baseline at this point, and if you excavate over here, what is the increasing bending moment? And it's difficult to see over here, but if you go over here, you start to see a bending moment developing at every excavation level. Meaning that as you excavate here, you're gonna have a large incremental bending at that particular location as you all expect. The important thing, other thing, important thing to look at is that the black line is the plaxis analysis done in design. And what you can see is that the bending calculation in the plaques, it is smaller bending calculated, whereas the actual measurement is giving larger bending. So why is that? So you can do a simple, uh, if you, uh, in this case, it's a flak analysis, where you do a 2D axis metric model, you use a more Coulomb saw model that was used in design, and then you design your concrete wall, and then you do a sort of a excavation process to simulate the excavation to see how the bending moment is developing in your computer. And there are two things uh, what we do is that uh, here, um, one is called FLAC, which is the um, more Coulomb model. I just show you the more Coulomb model is what they use in design. So if you look at this one, red is the design analysis, which you see less bending moment compared to the actual measurement, which is shown in black dots, which shows a larger bending moment than what you, we measure, uh, we predicted. And then we show, of course, you want to do a little bit more advanced soil model. So we call it advanced soil constitutive model. And I'll tell you what the advanced constitutive model is later on. But if you use advanced constitutive model, you can get a larger bending moment prediction, similar to what we measure. So the question is that, what is the advanced model? The advanced model is what we call hook brown model, which you may know very well in terms of sort of a modeling some soft rock. But the point is that even though we do hook brown, actually this particular material when you excavate is not yielding. In other words, this chalk 
is very good chalk, so it's behaving like an elastic material. However, if you use a more Coulomb model, if you use a conservative parameters like friction angle of 35 degrees and cohesion of 20 kPa, which is quite low conservative for your chalk, then what you get is that your structure will go like this because your chalk will yield. And if it yields, it can't have to straight, it has to transfer its stress to better place. So you're going to have a much larger movement where your elements yield it, meaning that your wall will bend less so. But if it's elastic, then you can have much higher concentration and stresses. In other words, your wall will bend more. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the low cohesion in the chalk, you want it to be on the safe side in the geotechnical engineering. But then for this, for the wall, it's the other way around because the stiffer soil cars sharper bulge because the soil can carry the shear resistance and therefore the wall has to bend more. So sharper bulge means more localized bending in a sense that uh, more localized bending, which is shown over here. So what I wanted to say in this particular case is that to be conservative types in the geotechnical engineering may not be good for structural engineering. And that is the message I wanted to know. And you could only see that when you start to measure the real performance of these walls. Uh, there's something other things that we wanted to do. For example, uh, we wanted to know the uh, stiffness uh, because these panels are always sort of a, uh, sort of there's some joints over here meaning that the stiffness in the vertical direction may be different from the stiffness in the horizontal direction because there's some joint closure that will give you smaller stiffness. So you can start to model your uh, flak analysis by incorporating the stiffness of uh, anisotropic stiffness of your wall. And you can start to show the, or the red one is the vertical stiffness and the blue one is your circumferential stiffness. And what we tend to see is that as it goes deeper, your data set, our real fiber optics data, and the prediction matches better when you have a larger, smaller stiffness in the circumferential direction. In other words, at the top, your joint may be better, but as you go deeper, maybe the joint may become less connected and therefore you have less circumferential uh, uh, stiffness. So, so what you can do is with these analysis with the real data set is to really to understand the real performance of your walls. Um, finally, I'd like to show quickly about uh, this Paddington site. Uh, maybe uh, I think I'd like to invite more of a question and answer. So uh, maybe next time when I speak, I'll talk about this later on. But I hope it's a similar story is that once you measure your material or uh, structures, you start to understand the performance of your geotechnical uh, engineering. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm gonna skip this today and then trying to go to the conclusion. So in summary, I think the innovation in sensor is coming as part of internet and things and we see this always. I'm sure my uh, 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 Dr. Wayne Miller will talk about new innovations coming as well. But there is an exciting time for us in geotechnical engineering because we would like to understand the real performance of our infrastructure during construction and operation. And for example, like distributed fiber optics, especially embedded one can give you useful strain data that no other sensor can give, meaning that you start to give a lot of data which we're not, we're not used to and we have to train ourselves to use that kind of data. And that means that if you can, for example, fiber optics can last for a very long time as a sensor. So monitoring systems should be, can be an integral part of the construction package, which can be used for long-term proactive operation monitoring. That means that you use the fiber optics or sensor for quality control. You use the same monitoring for maintenance. You can use it for sudden changes if an earthquake happens, and then you can use it for reuse.
So that leads to what we call performance design, construction, and maintenance. And I think we are now at the age that we can measure. And so let's take the opportunity to measure so that we can really realize this performance-based design, construction, and maintenance. Uh, if you want to know more details, so there's some best practice guides that we uh, 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 and have. And then uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Soga, for that interesting presentation. So, Professor Soga, this question comes from Samuel, who would like to ask if you could please elaborate. Uh, what is the difference between using YJAC with the OCEL method? Which one is the most accurate with the PDA test? Um, I'm not really into uh, which one is more reliable. I think our, our interest is really trying to measure for given test data, uh, test loading method, uh, what kind of strain we can get and what kind of a data set we can get. So I'm not in the position to give that particular uh, uh, sort of a, which, which one is better. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. Okay. Um, this one says that, let's say if the fiber breaks, let's say during a construction or earthquake uh, or at the start of it, uh, and you are not able to get the readings afterwards. So is there any suggestion to minimize? Yes, so, so that is where the know-how comes in and trying to pick the right cable. And uh, there is a tech, one of the technology that we use is that if you have one cut, then you, as long as you have access to, to two ends, you can go one end to up to that cut, and then you go to the other end, and then you go to that particular cut. So you can get the whole strain distribution. But if you have two cuts, you can't get the one in the middle that you lost. And, uh, but then uh, if you can do come back and then expose to the cut, you can fuse the cable and then connect it again, like what you do with electrical wiring. But of course that involves a lot of money to come back and fix it. And uh, the uh, know-how and then uh, the, the, the design, the practice is to ensure that you have a good cable that you never break. And that's what we're trying to promote. But it's very important things when you design a fiber optic installation. Okay, so this question says that how do we calculate uh, the total settlement of the pile? Essentially, the optical fiber gives the completion of the pile, but how about the changes or the contribution that comes from the soil? Yes, so, so the contribution of the soil, when you do a TZ analysis, actually, we're looking at the far end displacement, which is not moving. So, so I cannot get the displacement next to the uh, pile. But when we look at it, when we design, our TZ assumes that your, the Z is really a relative deformation of the soil far away from your pile to that. And then important thing to understand is that your friction, shaft friction is not just between the friction of the pile and the soil, if the soil itself will give you friction as well. So, so it's the both things, friction between the pile and the soil at the interface, but also the soil stiffness or soil resistance give you the friction or the shaft resistance. And what we're trying to do here is to TZ relationship on T combines both those together. Um, another question that comes here, Professor Soga, uh, is that uh, we know this non-destructive testing methods, for example, TDR or FDR, they are somehow soil dependent. For some soils, they're applicable, for some, they're not. So is there some sort of limitation like that to optical fiber? So can we apply that to any kind of soil strata? Yes, so in this particular case, it's purely a property of the, uh, the, the cable itself that we're measuring. So the assumption here is that we want to make sure that if concrete that is fibrous embedded into, the concrete strain will be properly transferred to the cable, which means that the cable and the concrete has to fully adhere together to move at the same strain. And then, uh, so, so, but the cables are very, very thin. So the actual stiffness is very, very small uh, in terms of the stiffness looking at the cross-sectional area. So, so if your massive concrete moves uh, uh, sort of a 100 micro strain, the embedded cable will move 100 micro strain, and that's what we're measuring. Um, the next question that comes is that, uh, does this monitoring with this fiber optic sensors 
necessitate for the permanent fixing of the equipment attached with it? Uh, the, the fiber will be embedded, but it's very, very cheap. But this particular analyzer or interrogator that will measure the strain, you can sort of a permanent fix it and then leave it for many, many years. But then at the moment, this uh, analyzer is very expensive. So maybe it's not uh, um, uh, cost effective. But what you can do is that you can bring it, you connect it, you make a readings and then disconnect. And later on, you can come back and connect again. And the important thing to understand here is that we're measuring the light characteristics in a sense that it's a bit like vibrating wire case staying gauges is that you're not affected. You're looking at the frequency change and therefore it's not affected by the connection and reconnection, the disconnection and reconnection effects. Meaning that if you reconnect, you get a very good quality data as well. Okay, uh, this question is a bit interesting. It says that uh, in some cases, the loading comes from mechanical loading as well as from the thermal loading, particularly in the case of energy piles. So should we use the, this optical fiber separately for temperature and loading for one, and then another one for mechanical loading? Or how, how do yes. we separate these two loading mechanisms? Yes, so, so uh, maybe uh, you may have read the paper that we wrote is that we use fiber optics for, uh, and then you will hear more about it next, 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 uh, next series that uh, Professor Sanchez will talk about. But the, um, we measure both, we have a temperature cable and the strain cable. But the strain cable actually measure thermal, uh, thermal mechanical strain. So, so that means that we need to do a temperature compensation to do the mechanical strain. And uh, if you're interested in, uh, please contact me and I can send you a paper on that. And that was one of the earlier cases that we were using to measure distributed strain of the energy piles. And that led to understanding how the energy pile behaves because we were understanding the distributed strain. And that gave us the framework to design our energy piles, which is given in that particular paper. Okay. Um, can we use this O cells for large dams? O cells for large dams. Uh, o cells are really for large diameter piles. So I'm not sure I can answer that particular question. Okay. Um, Wait, maybe you can, people do plate loading tests and maybe you can do plate loading tests, uh, bury the fiber, uh, fiber optics and then do a plate loading test to find the strain distribution in the ground. Okay, um, one que two questions two people have asked, uh, essentially around the data acquisition and analysis. So is there any kind of commercial system uh, for this temperature sen strain and acoustic sensoring or do we need any kind of individual or different uh, acquisition systems? Yeah, so, so you, this particular one temperature strain, you can use one particular acquisition system and they are commercially available. Uh, there are companies like in Switzerland or Japan, uh, they make these analyzer. We make our own analyzer and our interest is to make a cheaper analyzer uh, in the future. And so, so, so uh, but they are available and you can purchase the analyzer. Unfortunately, it's a bit expensive at the moment. It talks about probably cost about 80 to hundred thousand US dollars. Okay, so this question is, uh, there are two questions essentially for, for this particular, uh, uh, particular audience. So he wants to ask, do you approve the use of this fiber optic sensor as a replacement to the load cells? Uh, and the second thing is that hysteresis is a major issue with these type of sensors. Is it logical to find an unloading calibration curve function for a specific uh, simple unloading stress path and use it later for other unloading stress parts. Right, so, so would it be a replacement to the load cell? Uh, actually, uh, it's a good question, but we have to understand that load cell measure the load, whereas we are measuring the strain. And the link to the strain and the load cell is the stiffness of the material that you're measuring. So, so we're trying to measure the strain and then but we have to guesstimate or independently understand the stiffness of the material to get the load. So, so it's a complementary is the answer to that. And then in terms of hysteresis, actually the cable itself uh, will be elastic movement up to sort of 1%. So we don't see much uh, hysteresis in our readings when we do loading and unloading. 
Um, so during a tensile stress application, the fiber essentially will expand. However, during a compression stress application, how does it work? Uh, also, is there any limit to the compressive yeah. strain that the fiber can measure? Yes. So, so if, uh, if we embed the cable in a concrete, the cable can't go anywhere but embed it and then go to compressive strain. So the, the point is that we don't, it will measure the compressive strain probably up to 1%. But uh, in terms of if you're seeing like this particular uh, sort of an image, let's say we put the fiber optics and then you just see, then we, what we tend to do is that we pre-tension it a little bit. So by pre-tensioning, then we can measure the compression and tension because if it becomes real compression, it just slacks and then you can't measure anything. So we tend to pre-tension. Um, the next question is again, uh, regards to O-cell. And the question is that, is the sharp friction measure from the O-cell, especially at the top side of the O-cell is identical? If we use the Cantless method, considering soil experience tension at the top part, if using O-cell uh, and soil experience compression, if you're using Cantlage. Right. Um, if I understand correctly, uh, if we, in many of the cases, we measure the displacement at the old cell and we measure the displacement at the top. And what we do is that if you start from the top displacement and then you use a strain to compute the displacement to the bottom of your, where the top of the old cell is, and it matches nicely to the old cell displacement. In other words, that uh, the, 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 the performance are the same. Um, have you used these fiber optic sensors for an analyzing pile subjected to negative skin friction? Yes. So, so uh, energy pile is one of the uh, example. When you cool it, it gives you the negative friction and that's what we measure. Uh, is the current technology only measure strain and temperature data or has there been a development where uh, the integrator also performs analysis on these data into more meaningful engineering measurement, uh, such as bending stress and so on. Yes, so that's what we do internally is that once you get your strain or temperature, uh, also we get vibration characteristics as well, and that's called distributed acoustic sensing. So, so the dog running is using what we call distributed acoustic sensing technology. But what we do is that we get the raw data and then we convert it to uh, bending strain or whatever based on our understanding of geotechnical engineering. So this one comes from Luisa and Luisa says that, have you tried to understand the effect of heterogeneity of the material on the measurement? For example, with TC scans are performing a measurement on a model material. Yes, and um, if I understand the question correctly, the distributed strain is the reason I want to measure the heterogeneity because if you have lots of data, let's say if you get data every two centimeters, meaning that you can get, get the heterogeneity up to that particular level. So, so down to that particular level. And that's why the distributed strain will give you interesting understanding of the heterogeneity up to that particular scale. So, so um, the interesting is that like, for example, we just recently installed the fiber into the uh, lab, uh, sort of a reclamation land, and then you apply a load and then you kind of start to see which part of the soil is start to compress earlier. And do you see a soft layer and that sort of thing? And we can identify the heterogeneity. A bit like your CPT, the uh, beauty of the CPT is the continuous data set allows you to do the heterogeneity and the distributed strain is a bit like that too.